lessons as we go along. Um, I thought we would look at something different and do drawings this week because we've covered now architecture, sculpture and a lot of painting. So we've done the three kind of traditional mediums of the history of art and it's nice to step away from them and look at some paint, some drawing or some ceramics or some woodwork, this kind of thing. Um, because there are some really important pieces, some really important drawings in the history of art. And we've covered actually some of the, some of the things that we will look at today. So it may be, well, you may recognize some of them as we go along. Um, so I thought we would start with something medieval because when you say works on paper, which is kind of less specific than drawings because it can include prints, for example. So when you um, say works on paper, the first thing that comes to mind is often manuscripts, like medieval manuscripts. Um, and it's always amazing to me that manuscripts are our best surviving and most famous work on paper um, because they're so old and often because they're mainly medieval um, and it's just amazing because paper is the most fragile medium that we've looked at so far. Um, so we'll start with those uh, and I thought we would start with um, Muslim manuscripts or Islamic manuscripts because this amazing resource has just been um this big archive has just been released full of some really important manuscripts so it's kind of a good week to do it and it's also ramadan so why not and when i was looking at um muslim manuscripts and some information about them i came across this really amazing resource this website i've included a link to it which is about um, the Virgin Mary in medieval Islamic manuscripts. And um, I'm just gonna read you uh, part of this article. Um, and that's what we're gonna start with. So here goes. Um, in the Quran, the Virgin Mary is ranked among the holiest women in Islam, a group that includes Khadija or Khadija, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong if someone can correct me, and Aisha, the wives of the Prophet, and Fatima, his daughter. Like them, the Virgin Mary is held up as an example of piety and devotion of God to God. Exploring the place of the Virgin Mary in medieval Islamic culture can challenge our stereotypes of Muslim women, both medieval and contemporary. It also challenges a nasty stereotype that paints Islam as an inherently misogynistic religion. So um, it's just such a good article um, and a really nice place to start with um, religious manuscripts, I think, um, because often they can seem quite samey, um, but actually um, you can learn so much, uh, so much from them about like the details of different religions that often get overlooked, like the fact that the Virgin Mary is a really important um, figure in the Quran. And it kind of leads to a discussion about the similarities between the Bible and the Quran about certain stories. Um, and there are a lot of similarities when it comes to talking about the Virgin Mary, um, because obviously in the Quran, there are many um, prophets that are thought to have arrived before Muhammad, uh, one of them being Jesus. And when they tell the story of Jesus, um, it includes his mother, Mary, who is also a virgin who's been impregnated by the spirit of God. Um, and she also receives a message from the angel Gabriel. So there are those similarities between the Quran and the Bible. However, um, there are differences in the story and you can see the differences reflected on the screen here because in the Quran, the Virgin Mary gives birth alone. There is no kind of nativity scene um, shaded by palm trees and uh, God uh, creates this pool of water next to her so that she can drink. Um, so this is what you're seeing here in this manuscript. 
Um, and the amazing thing about manuscripts is that they're often, uh, I mean, they're meant to be read. So they have so much detail, like the inclusion of the pond, the specific inclusion of the type of tree. Um, and it's because they were produced for people who couldn't read. Um, so yeah, and, and I think, nowadays we're not really used to reading images so much we expect the message to be so obvious whereas um you know so when you go into a cathedral or you look at a really detailed manuscript we almost don't know how to take in so much detail in, in the same way that we used to um because these are images that are meant to be studied for hours and actually that um leads me to another detail in this a specific page that we're looking at and um, this is the crown that she's wearing on her head and so is Jesus actually and it's a crown of flames and basically this crown is referring to a debate that was apparently really um, well really important in medieval Islam and is still um, debated today which is whether the Virgin Mary should be considered a prophet or not apparently um, at one point in the Quran she is referred to as a prophet so many artists stuck by this and that's why you'll see her with a crown of flames which is how prophets were represented um, but other times she wasn't represented with a crown of flames like I think this in this image she isn't um, so so yeah this is a, a a page that's kind of bringing up that debate, I suppose. Someone has asked how this image was coloured, um, which is a good question because, um, I mean, it's not the best reproduction, so I can't say for sure, but it seems like it's got gold leaf um, in the background and in the crown, um, which is, again, uh, it kind of shows how, um, how important these documents were that they would be like given such expensive materials that are laid onto them so delicately um and they were really meant to last which is we don't normally associate paper with durability and this kind of historical religious importance but even from when it was made it was really treated as something um that was almost like jewelry you know covered in in gold um and speaking of the colour, you can see that the Virgin Mary is wearing the familiar blue cloak um, and she's often wearing red and blue. So she is a recognisable figure. I think she is here as well, wearing the red and blue. So, um, so yeah, I thought this was really interesting. Um, and when I uh, was looking at these manuscripts, I remembered, like I mentioned, that we have looked at one uh, Islamic manuscript before. We saw these two images when we were doing the class on um, the destruction of sculpture, I think it was, that class. Um, and we talked about the misunderstanding or the stereotype that Islamic art doesn't include figures, which, I mean, looking at this, and looking at this image of the Virgin Mary is obviously not true or is rather like too simple. Um, so yeah, we have seen these before. On the left hand side here, you've got the uh, Prophet Muhammad and you can see his crown of flames has extended to include his whole body. Um, I won't go into the covering of the face and this uh, signification and the history of this stereotype about figural um, imagery being banned in Islam because we um, went over it in the destruction of sculpture class if anyone wants to go back and look at it. But um, in that class we did talk about the image on the right, the Ottoman image, because we weren't sure um, at that point why some faces were covered and some weren't. But I was looking into this for the works on paper class and um, found out that it actually tells, uh, it's a picture of the Prophet Muhammad and um, three of his wives and, um, and his daughter in the foreground. 
And so basically it's not the covering of the face isn't segregated by gender. It's actually segregated by holiness um, because the women also are covered in this image. Um, so yeah, I thought that was, I thought that was really interesting and, and something to um, mention in this class, especially when we're talking about misconceptions about gender stereotypes in, um, Islam, I just thought it was interesting that often you'll find more women and really important women and really holy women in the um, Islamic manuscripts than the Christian ones. Um, so yeah, I thought this was an interesting place to start. Um, but not all Islamic manuscripts um, are religious not all manuscripts are religious even though there are tons of christian manuscripts and um i wanted to include a a very famous manuscript here which is really fun and it's called the book of games and it was made in the 13th century um by alfonso the 10th who had conquered a part of spain and was a christian king but was ruling in an area of majority Muslims, uh, you know, mainly Islamic kingdoms at that time. And his book of games um, really represents this multicultural and really tolerant religious society. Like this is a picture of a Christian um, and a Moor playing chess. Uh, so a Christian and a Muslim playing chess. And um, the Book of Games was a manuscript, um, well, it's a really interesting manuscript that uh, looks at the importance of playing games in a functioning society. So this is a really um, good one to look at. You can find really good reproductions online. I'm not sure where the original is. Um, maybe I can find out. Um, but like I said, not all... Um, Islamic manuscripts are religious, and this brings me on to my next point because I found another really, really interesting article. And again, I've included the link. And um, it basically is about the fact that probably the most famous, um, or, well, Islamic manuscripts are best known probably for their science. They are full of like medieval scientific discoveries. Um, and that is a fact. But what this article explains um, is probably one of the most interesting reactions to the rise in Islamophobia that I've ever come across really. It basically explains that people are forging um, Islamic scientific manuscripts at the moment. It's like a, a problem in the art market and also a problem in academia, um, is that these realistic looking images are being shared. Um, and they're quite, you know, they're made with a lot of detail, but you know, certain things give away the fakeness of the image, like the vibrancy of the color, for example. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not a specialist in manuscripts, but um, you can tell by the the pen by all sorts of things. Um, so it's really interesting because what the article explains is that um, as Islamophobia has uh, risen, this, uh, this trend towards selling and exhibiting um, scientific Islamic manuscripts has come about as a way to kind of like um, remind people of the all these positive things about Islam um, which is nice sad at the same time uh, and what the article really stresses is that it's unnecessary to make these fakes because we have tons of real medieval um, Islamic science from all over the the world to be honest and like I've said in other classes sometimes you want to you well sometimes you want to avoid the word Islamic art or Islamic manuscript because it, I mean, it, it's so broad. It covers such a vast time period and geographic period, so many different Islamic kingdoms and dynasties. 
it's often much better to just say the region or the dynasty that you're talking about. But when it comes to the science, you can really across the board say that most Islamic manuscripts have really important science in them. So um, the fakes are just interesting, really, um, because if you think about the classes that we've done on Orientalism, so much of Orientalism and colonialism was about trying to separate um, Middle Eastern cultures from modernity, trying to make them look um, ancient, making sure that there was no, you know, um, interruption of modern gadgets or scientific gadgets in their representations of the Middle East. Um, when actually um, these manuscripts show that it was a really important part of the culture. So I suppose this is a way of, of um, like underlining the, the place that Islam has in a modern world because it's always been scientific and we associate science with modernity and all this stuff. Um, so yeah, this is an interesting point. I mean, the fakes are beautiful but as I said um, unnecessary so yeah I went into a bit of a rabbit hole with this I just thought it was so interesting and I found um, some other medieval fakes <laughs> like this one which um, which is uh, a woman painting a female nude which is really uh, ambitious and <laughs> utopian I suppose, but it shows that, you know, other groups have also tried this um, method of creating fakes like um, that promote positive ideas about women's emancipation. And it's interesting to me that the medieval period um, is used in this way. It's kind of like, oh, if it happened in the medieval period, then it's been around for so long that, it sh that it's a good thing and it's natural. Um, so it's kind of trying to say that women, women uh, were free even in the medieval period and it's trying to challenge contemporary stereotypes using these really old looking images. Um, but sadly this image is, is too, too ambitious <laughs> and not, not true. Uh, women weren't painting female nudes in the medieval period. Um, so, so yeah, it's quite a random start to looking at works on paper but you can't really do works on paper without dipping into manuscripts at least in some way um, so there is actually on my next slide there are um, kind of some other drawings that we have looked at before I'm moving from the medieval period to the Renaissance, which is quite traditional of me in the traditional chronology of art history. Um, and you can see immediately how much drawing changed. Um, it becomes much more lifelike. And we talked about these stylistic differences in the class on Spanish painting, I think it was, um, and how you can recognize the different drawing styles of different artists and how much it teaches you about um, about their paintings as well. So, um, so yeah, I won't spend too much time on these Renaissance drawings, um, but there is another manuscript that we looked at, which is in the same time period as these Renaissance drawings, you know, only 20 years after the Sistine Chapel was painted, and that is the Mendoza Codex, um, which we looked at in the Mexico class. A really important historical manuscript about the Aztecs, which you can flick through in the Bodleian, in the Bodleian Library. Um, and I won't go into detail about it now, but this, I suppose, um, concludes the first part of this class, which is looking at manuscripts and remembering the art historical importance that they that they have um, and this is kind of all the sort of images that we've already looked at before in this class so that's the end of part one I suppose I then wanted to move on and 
talk about how manuscripts um, had a sort of rebirth in the 19th and 20th century um, with the arts and crafts movement. Um, so this is, it's a really interesting, I mean, I know we've jumped centuries. We've gone from medieval Renaissance stuff into the 20th century, but I wanted to, to make that jump because when you get into the Renaissance, you can even see actually, if we go back, that drawings become sketches, like they become preparatory works um, for something else, like just the basis of a, of a painting, um, instead of being like works of art in their own right, kind of like manuscripts, or even kind of like the Mendoza Codex, which is just like an art piece in its own right. Um, so obviously these Renaissance drawings are beautiful, but they weren't meant to be hung or sold. They were just um, for the artist's own preparation. And it's only in the last few decades that we have these amazing drawing exhibitions and that we really study them. Um, and so that's why I'm jumping to the uh, 19th century, because that's the moment when artists, you know, are starting to get a bit fed up with the system. This is the same time as the Impressionists are starting to, um, you know, reject academic ways of painting. Um, and the arts and crafts movement is a movement that develops um, out of this kind of sense of being fed up, particularly because they were just fed up of this obsession with painting and sculpture. And they wanted to um, remind people that there are other forms of art that um, should be regarded as fine art, like textiles or bookmaking, printing, um, drawing, for example. And in order to um, make their point, they start, they, you know, they look back to these manuscripts, these medieval manuscripts, um, as this high point of the appreciation of craft instead of art. So the real admiration of technique, um, you know, painstaking technique because laying gold leaf and creating a manuscript takes such a long time. So this is what the arts and crafts movement was about. Um, it was about looking back to um, old crafts, whether it was medieval manuscripts or maybe folk art um, and trying to revive the appreciation for um, non-paintings like drawings, for example. Um, very long-winded description of the arts and crafts movement. Um, I apologize. But um, this image that we're looking at is a wallpaper drawing and um, you can see in the kind of, in the colour scheme, for example, in the linearity, um, that it's influenced by um, medieval kind of styles. And this is one of my favourite arts and crafts wallpapers um, ever. Uh, William Morris is much more famous as an arts and crafts person. And I think he did the wallpaper in the National Gallery Cafe or, I don't know, there's so much William Morris stuff out there. Um, so I wanted to include someone different, but um, it's worth, if you're interested in the arts and crafts movement and if you like um, the aesthetic of manuscripts and want to um, find like their modern equivalent, it's worth looking at the VNA website because they have a huge arts and crafts collection um, where you can find loads of this stuff. I've always found the arts and crafts movement interesting because it, it happens at the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th century. So like I said, it's contemporary with the development of Impressionism, um, post-Impressionism, and then into the early 20th century, cubism and um, abstract painting. And so it seems like it should be 
it almost seems too different to be happening in parallel with these things because, um, you know, the most radical and famous artists were really rejecting um, the old and trying to push painting beyond the boundaries that it had ever gone before. But the arts and crafts artists were doing something really different and they were actually looking backwards instead of forwards. Um, and um, yeah, and I've always just thought that that was really interesting and they produce really beautiful stuff. And one of the ones that I'm gonna focus on is um, this really famous arts and crafts manuscript from uh, 1920 by a Viennese artist um, who decided to tell this German story. Um, it's, a, it's a very famous medieval German tale about Vikings. Um, and I, I love it honestly purely for <laughs> the aesthetic value. It's just so beautiful and you can kind of see in the um, in the style that um, Cheshka, who is the artist, was a very good friend of Klimt, who was another really important artist of the arts and crafts style. Um, you can kind of see in his drawings, it kind of reminds you of the kiss. Um, so yeah, I love, 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 love this um, manuscript. And it's really childlike on purpose. Um, I mean, it's, I suppose, you can't really say it's simplified because it's really, really detailed. Um, but the story is meant to be very clear. Um, it has no text. It's almost like trying to be a children's book. And that is probably one of the few things that connects the arts and crafts artist, artists with the, um, you know, radical Picasso style avant-garde artists who were painting. Um, if you think of Matisse or Picasso or um, Kandinsky or all of these artists, they would also turning towards something more childlike. Um, so that kind of connects them is this rejection of really um, almost pretentious, you could say, styles um, and this newfound appreciation for childlike uh clarity in your images so obviously the arts and crafts artists interpret that very differently to um the avant-garde the other artists of the avant-garde but it's still there this kind of appreciation for childhood so yeah this manuscript i mean it's just it's just beautiful i just have to include it because i love the way it looks and it's another one to um look at online you can flick through all the pages and read the story. And just like a medieval manuscript, the point of the manuscript is that you read the story visually. Um, and this is another thing that the arts and crafts movement was trying to save, like our ability to read images and to use images as texts, um, which is something that they felt society was losing as it became more secular um, and yeah, so, so it's definitely one to try and read. Um, like I said, you may think um, that the arts and crafts movement kind of failed because um, we know the late 19th century and the early 20th century much more for things like Impressionism, Fauvism or artists like Van Gogh or um, Picasso who are all painters really like when you think of the big names of the 20th century you might even think Jackson Pollock like these huge painters so you may think that yeah that the arts and crafts movement potentially failed and didn't manage to make people uh, remember the importance of non-paintings of crafts and textiles and paper um, but it's not entirely true like I said there were um, mutual interests in the groups and a lot of the artists 20th century artists who 
we remember mainly as um, painters um, worked in loads of different media and paper was one of the most important. And that's why I loved and I love this exhibition which um, opened this year at the Royal Academy, which is a whole exhibition dedicated to Picasso's use of paper. So I'm just going to check the WhatsApp for questions or if anyone has been to this exhibition. Um, but if not, I've included, I think, a link somewhere on this PowerPoint and in the notes to the um, virtual tour which they've posted online at the Royal Academy. So it's really worth looking at. Um, yeah, and it really makes you realise that Picasso was much more than just a, a painter. So the exhibition starts with one series that is going to be the next thing that we focus on, I suppose. Um, and it's called the 156 Engravings. And these are probably Picasso's most famous um, works on paper, um, mainly because they are so late in his artistic career, towards the end of his life, they're from 1968, but also because there's just so many of them. Um, I can't remember, ex well actually, 156 might be the telling thing here. Um, over a hundred uh, for sure. Um, he made them obsessively, uh, kind of ferociously if you look at the style and they're really, they're quite samey. And even in the title, um, he doesn't give much away, but they've become famous basically for how erotic they are. Um, but the label erotic really simplifies this series because actually it's a series all about the relationship between uh, the male painter and the female model, like the female nude. So every, um, every single engraving in this series contains uh, a man and a woman, a male painter and a female model. Um, sometimes multiple men, like you can see here. And actually, it's not, it's not an easy relationship. It's shown as a really tormented relationship in almost, every, um, in almost every engraving. Like in this one, for example, if you zoom in on the man, he's made to look really um, creepy, ugly. <laughs> um, he doesn't show the male artist in the most positive light. And... Um, that's why this series is so um, interesting, really, because um, it's all about like what art historians call the politics of looking. And this image that we have on the screen is, to me, like the perfect um, representation of the fact that this series, you know, that what Picasso was interested in in this series was not eroticism, but rather like looking and how we look at things and how a male artist looks at a female model um, and I think he decides that it's not necessarily an equal or a positive relationship uh, and it's a relationship that's shaped by social and political factors which is why we call it the politics of looking um, and I think he was asking himself the question of why is the you know why is the man always looking at the naked woman why is there a crazy obsessive amount of female nudity in the history of art um and it's a question that feminist artists would ask themselves and it's just interesting that picasso produced this work if you want to interpret it in this way because he was um at the end of a career um where he was basically famous for his female nudes for every female nude or even painting of a woman that he'd uh, made before this didn't include the man. And this is quite typical of female nudes. They don't include um, men because the whole idea is that you're meant to forget about the man um, 
and you know it's it's meant to feel like you're not doing anything wrong you're not being voyeuristic or anything um no one is no one else is in the scene judging you i suppose um whereas picasso really like completely changes that and includes um includes the man and forces you quite ob like to obviously in this picture to consider um to consider how female nudes are made which is by looking um so it's a really 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 interesting um series and like i said his most famous work on paper but he did tons of inventive things with paper uh engravings collages uh, sculptures he worked a lot with cardboard um, so for him it was a really fruitful medium and um, it's true. so I was saying with the um, with this image that it forces you to think about the politics of looking which sounds like a really intimidating like nonsensical term but it's basically um, something that feminist artists ask people to consider um like to ask yourselves questions like who is looking at who and why um, and why is it always that men are looking at women as opposed to women looking at men and questions like this they felt really reveal wider um political forces and like social trends for example um and and Picasso, I think, is asking that question quite obviously. Um, and he was a very political artist. So I'm not surprised if towards the end of his career, he would have started thinking about feminist politics. Um, you know, he was uh, um, interested in communist politics. Um, his most famous painting, Guernica um, in Madrid, is extremely political. It's a critique on Franco's dictatorship. So, um, I think it's yeah it's it's not, it's refreshing to look at Picasso in this way. Um, someone else has asked a question: um, Has the way paper is produced changed over the centuries, and does this affect what is drawn and how long it survives? Uh, yeah, really good question. Um, I don't have the technical expertise, I suppose, to answer this, but it is certainly true that the development of the printing press. Um, in the 17th century um, really changed like the dissemination of images on paper they didn't have to be these like finely crafted um, you know super delicate things like religious manuscripts for example they could suddenly be etchings and engravings and even though I said that um, paper wasn't really appreciated um, well, actually, no, drawing wasn't really appreciated as an art form in its own right um, until the 20th century with the arts and crafts movement. It's certainly true that um, etching and engraving and these sorts of um, printing works on paper were, you know, huge and pretty much everywhere, most famously with Rembrandt's etchings. Um, but yeah, all across the world, and they were a really important part of the dissemination of information. Um, they were really important in the colonial era with things like Orientalism as well for like producing images fast, like black and white images that didn't take as long as paintings, for example. Um, so that was an important technical development. Um, are engravings considered art or craft? That's a good question. Um, I didn't go into engravings and etchings. They, they do fall into works on paper for sure. And that's why I wanted to include this Picasso series. And I just couldn't help it because I find it so interesting. But engravings and etchings really deserve like a whole session in their own right because um, they used to be, you know, they were treated with this very scientific, kind of documentation purpose but you can't discuss their history without talking about Rembrandt because Rembrandt really changed etching and engraving and he started um, 
he started producing etchings and engravings that were almost like paintings and they were meant to change every time they were printed. Um, it's kind of, it's a whole topic really for another lesson. Um, and lots of artists like Picasso, um, also like David Hockney, uh, are really tried to go back to um, that use of etching, engraving, and you know, works on paper as like works of art in their own right and mediums that weren't just functional but actually had like their own artistic value. Because I think that's the the problem with paper is it's always been forgotten um, because most of its uses like engraving or printing or book producing or whatever are so functional um, that people forget that they are like a there are all these different creative things that you can do with them so yeah good questions um keep asking questions because the after picasso i realized i included this image um because I just couldn't help it. <laughs> she's a different artist, obviously, Frida Kahlo. Uh, and I mean, she's a 20th century artist as well and as famous as Picasso, but um, I just had to, yeah, I just had to briefly mention it because this drawing was included in the v &A Frida Kahlo exhibition. And it's just a really good example of, um, of the perks of studying drawing, I suppose because it's such a small doodle, but it's actually full of um, politics. Like at the bottom of the um, sketch, she writes Pueblo Jodido, which means like um, the uh, working classes are screwed or like the villages are screwed basically. Um, and it's, um, it's like her, her comment on the um the kind of um bad bits of the american dream and all the things that the american dream misses um so i think it's just interesting because paper is so disregarded that often artists used it as like a really frantic outlet without thinking too much about how it would be exhibited or whatever it's just kind of like a um, I suppose it's a more uncensored, um, like look into artists' politics because it's not, it's not kind of perfected on a canvas or on this really huge scale. So often you can get more um, nuanced understandings of an artist's political inclinations when you look at their works on paper. I think um, so. I had to include this one. Um, my gosh, it's almost seven o'clock. This almost happens to me. Um, I wasn't going to talk too much about collage, but we've mentioned engravings, we've mentioned drawings, and collage is a, again, it's another one of these works on paper that um, deserves a whole session. So I, I think I will leave it because this is one of the most famous collages of the 20th century by a um, artist called Hannah Hock, who was living in Weimar, Germany, and um, she's commenting on the interwar politics and her style, which we really take for granted now, but was really radical at the time, um, has influenced so many artists, in particular Martha Rosler, who's a really famous American um, photographer who used collage to talk about the war that she was um, the war period that she was living in, which was the Vietnam War. And she basically collaged photographs of the war with um, cutouts from magazines to kind of make a comment on, um, on the passivity of people at home and also how desensitized we've become to images. So the fact that you can flick through a magazine and see a war photograph and flick to the next magazine and see an advert she just found that really jarring. Um, so, and she was really influenced by Hannah Hock. Um, and she then did the same series about the um, Iraq war. So she's a really interesting artist. Well, both of them are, Martha Rosler and Hannah Hock. And they really show um, 
how political different types of works on paper can be. Um, and I think it's, yeah, like I say, I think it's just because paper has this like throwaway quality. Um, another question, did drawings and etchings emerge alongside printing and therefore had a wider public reach than a painting in a gallery? Yes, this is a really good um, question. Like for example, cartoons on early newspapers were popular as the majority of the population were not literate. Yeah, this is really um, a really good point. It's another one of these qualities of um, paper. It's kind of more diplomatic or democratic, I suppose you could say, um, because it's more reproducible. Uh, so it we reached a wider audience. Um, so definitely with things like the printing press and things like engravings, they were designed yeah designed to be reproduced but what ha what that means is that people stopped um stopped uh treating them as kind of high works of art because we have this idea that a work of art has to be unique original not reproducible um and especially that's a really important concept for the art market because it's much more difficult to sell something that exists in a million copies and even now people are very picky about how many um how many versions of an etching or an engraving you can make um so yeah it's it's another reason why paper has kind of been left behind as a medium in the history of art because um it's considered too mass producible or has been considered i suppose too mass producible um is that a word i'm not even sure uh, but to kind of be high art, like a sculpture or a, or a painting. So yeah, it's a really it's a really good point. Um, this is going back to Picasso. I, just to say that he also did collages, and he also did um, work like drawings on newspapers. So it's probably the best example of his use of paper is this kind of throwaway um material that he could unleash his political opinions on like he's drawing on this communist newspaper for example um someone has commented isn't that just the art world being very highbrow when we were talking about the disregard of uh paper which is definitely um is definitely true and it's something that lots of contemporary artists are going well are trying to challenge and that actually brings me beautifully on to my next artist um who also did this picasso style like manipulation of newspapers and um this is a series by Luvena hamid who won the turner prize a few years ago um i can't remember what year but she's a yeah really important artist, the first black woman to win the prize, and she um, she made this series to challenge uh, many things, like to challenge um, our obsession with paintings having to be canvases um, to to produce something that was more um, lowbrow, I suppose you could say but mainly to challenge um, racism in the media. So what she does is she, um, she covers the text and makes a point that um, images of um, people of color are always put alongside negative headlines, even if it's not necessarily about them. She kind of notices this trend and um, highlights it. And the point that she's making is that we receive, you know, we produce and we receive without even realizing it, these negative associations um, and visual images can be really powerful in that sense. Um, so yeah, this is a really like purposefully um, political series that's worth looking more into Well, all of her works are worth looking into um like for example this you've got a successful athlete story uh next to a story about friends being in prison um and she highlights this visual connection being made between the two that we might otherwise not notice so 
so yeah this is a contemporary artist trying to um to make uh to use mass produced images uh to challenge the art market um to try and challenge uh racism in and outside of the art market like that that's what she also does she also does these ceramics which i've included here which i think are just beautiful um i think i included some more no these are the only ones um so yeah she's worth looking into i i think i mean it's seven o'clock the same the same thing almost always happens to me um i think i'll leave it there for um for today because we've done so much <laughs> so many different things but i think the only point that i wanted to make looking at works on paper is that um they always get overlooked a eh? and that they exist in many different forms like manuscripts or collages or engravings um but probably the most important thing for me is that they have uh, so much political content obviously because paper is so um, discardable. So I think it's always worth, when you're in an exhibition, at least what I try and do, is um, going to those little smaller cabinets and spending more time looking at those, like looking at the book pages that are exhibited, um, because I think they often have the richest um, content. And that's why you find these gems like the Frida Kahlo drawing, that often tell you more about the about the artist. Um, this artist that we're looking at and the last one that I mentioned is called Luvena Hamid. I will post her name because I can see I haven't written her name. Um, I will post her name on the, um, on the notes and in the PowerPoint when I upload it. Um, she's definitely worth looking at. And she did this, this, these images that we're looking at were part of an exhibition that she did in Oxford that was all, um, paper, newspaper and ceramics. So, so yeah, it's really interesting. Um, next week, I think we will have to, because I had more images to look at <laughs> all this stuff. Um, uh, and I think I had, I was going to finish on some Japanese prints. So I think what we could do next week is maybe do like an extension of this works on paper class and look more closely at printing and engraving um, 